Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Christine Neff, Associate Professor in Human Development and Culture at the University of Texas, and she's here to talk to us today about self-compassion. Hello, Christine. Welcome to the MWS podcast. Ah, oh, hello. Thanks for having me. Can you start by telling us something about your background and, and how you became involved with self-compassion? Uh, for me, it was really a personal journey. I learned about self-compassion when I first became began to practice Buddhist meditation. And uh, shortly thereafter, I did some postdoctoral study with a woman who was studying self-concept development. And I realized that no one had studied self-compassion from a research perspective before. Uh, so since it was so powerful in my personal life, I started doing research on the construct. And here we are. Okay. So how is self-compassion different then from self-esteem and why is it important not to confuse the two? Well, self-esteem, it, it's good to have high self-esteem as opposed to low self-esteem. It's associated with a lot of mental health benefits. The problem really is how do you get your high self-esteem? Um, you know, in our society, typically you have to be special and above average to have high self-esteem which is a problem given it's a logical impossibility for everyone to be special and above average at the same time. So what happens is it sets up this process of social comparison where we're always saying, is this person better than me in one way? Are they prettier, smarter, more successful? Uh, and of course, uh, the answer often is no, and then we feel bad about ourselves. Um, another problem with self-esteem is that it's contingent, right? It's contingent on success. So we may have high self-esteem when we nail that business deal or, you know, that, that cute boy or girl asks us out for a date. But what happens when we aren't successful and we fail? Typically, our self-esteem takes a nosedive. So self-compassion, uh, self-esteem is a, is a way of evaluating ourselves positively, this contingent on external factors. Self-compassion doesn't involve self-evaluation. It just involves treating oneself kindly, and therefore it's not contingent on success. It's there for you exact, precisely when you need it most, when you fail. Um, so it's more stable and doesn't require constant comparisons with others. Okay. Would you say that different parts of our brains are being accessed when we're involved with self-esteem as opposed to self-compassion? Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, we don't know for sure what parts of the brain are associated with self-esteem, but it's probably linked to the drive system, yeah. our drive and achievement system, right, which motivates us, releases dopamine, et cetera, to reach goals, to have success. Uh, Self-compassion appears to be associated with the caregiving, self-soothing system. And therefore, when we give ourselves compassion, we're tapping into the same system that you know, any mammalian infant, <laughs> um, they feel uh, safe, warm, secure, soothed in the presence of things like warmth, uh, gentle touch, gentle vocalizations. So they really do tap into two different systems. And why for you is self-compassion so important? Well, uh, let me just quickly define what self-compassion is, yeah. is that some listeners may not really understand, at least how I define it. Um, so I define self-compassion really as treating yourself like you treat a good friend, um, being kind, caring, and concerned with yourself when you're suffering, whether that suffering comes from failure or personal inadequacy, or if the suffering just comes from something difficult happening in your life. So with self-compassion, we're kind. We aren't harshly judgmental of ourselves. Um, really important, too, is we frame our experience in light of the shared human experience as opposed to feeling isolated. You know, what happens unconsciously is when we fail or make a mistake or something difficult happens in our lives, we, we feel this shouldn't be happening. This is abnormal somehow. It's a baseline. is everything's going perfectly. So when something doesn't go perfectly, 
We feel like something has gone wrong, we feel abnormal, and therefore we feel isolated. So with self-compassion, we're always framing our experience in light of the shared human experience. So we actually feel connected in our imperfect humanity with others. And then the last component is mindfulness. Um, you know, you have to be mindfully aware that you're suffering in order to open your heart to yourself. If, if you're just focused on problem-solving mode, or you're just focused on beating yourself up, you aren't going to be able to really step outside yourself and say, wow, this is really hard right now. What I need is some care and kindness. So those are really the three components. And the reason it's so um, important is that it's an amazing resource uh, of emotional resilience, really. So first of all, it makes us feel loved, cared for, connected, uh, and from a source that's always available ourselves. Uh, it allows us to cope with things like failure. Um, it allows us to motivate ourselves, not from a place of thinking we aren't good enough if we don't achieve our goals, but from a place of caring. We want to thrive, uh, uh, do our best, but at the same time, we're there to catch ourselves when we fail. Um, so it really is just a, I mean, the research overwhelmingly shows the mental health benefits of self-compassion. Uh, allows you to cope with the difficulties of life and also allows you to cope with the fact that we are imperfect human beings. Um, at, least, at least I am. I don't know about you, Barry. <laughs> Uh, what, what aspects of self-compassion are people most resistant to in your experience? Well, it really is this piece about motivation. People, you know, it used to be the saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah. People used to believe you needed harsh corporal punishment to motivate children and make them, you know, um, be good citizens. Uh, people have dropped that with parenting, but they still hold it for themselves. Right. So they think if they don't harshly criticize themselves, you can beat themselves up, they'll let themselves off the hook, they'll let themselves get away with everything, they won't try. Um, it really actually is exactly the opposite, and the research supports the finding that it's the opposite. So when we criticize ourselves as a way of motivating us, it, it kind of works. We wouldn't do it if it didn't work to some degree, but it has some unfortunate consequences. Uh, for instance, it makes us afraid of failure because we know it will happen if we fail. It creates a lot of anxiety as we try new tasks, again, because we know it will happen if we fail. And uh, eventually it causes us to lose faith in ourselves. If we motivate ourselves out of compassion, just think of a really compassionate, supportive parent or coach. Yeah. If the parent or coach, maybe when, when you fail, says, hey, it's okay, everyone fails, I accept you exactly as you are, but how can I encourage you and support you to make a change? And that warm, supportive language um, really creates an optimal emotional environment for doing one's best. I can relate to the idea of um, being non-judgmental. Just got a question about remorse. How does remorse tie with, with self-compassion? I'm just thinking mm -hmm. of something like restorative justice, like an mm -hmm. empathic process which relies on remorse as a starting point between perpetrator and victim. Yes. So um, there's a distinction in the literature between shame and guilt. Okay. Shame is I am bad for doing something. Guilt is what I did was bad. I'm sorry. How can I repair it? Self-compassion is positively linked with guilt, negatively linked to shame, is what the research suggests. Self-compassionate people are more likely to apologize. They're more likely to take responsibility for what they've done. So with self-compassion, it gives us the safety needed to admit, wow, I messed up. Right. Wow, I harmed you. Yeah. And because it's safe to admit it, uh, therefore we're able to you know, admit it, and because we want well-being for ourselves and for others, because it's a type of connected thinking, um, we're more likely to repair the situation. If I'm a habitual self-critic, I will do everything I can to blame you <laughs> and not accept responsibility because it's too painful if I do. So it really facilitates taking responsibility. Um, you don't let yourself off the hook, and again, research really supports this. Yeah, that makes sense. So just to get this clear, so say someone was unfaithful with someone else, if they mm -hmm. felt shame and they got caught, then they're going to feel bad because of what other people think about them. 
But if you yeah. feel guilty, then you're going to empathize with the person that you've hurt. Yes, exactly. So, so shame is an incredibly self-focused emotion. You know, all I can think about is me, 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 and how bad I am. So guilt is an other-focused emotion. So if I have self-compassion and I don't have to worry about judging myself, you know, I have the emotional resources to think about the other person, how this has affected them, um, and thinking about how you can repair the situation. Yeah. So they really, people give guilt a bad rap. <laughs> At least how it's defined in the psychological literature, you actually want guilt. There's healthy guilt. Yeah, um, no, I can I can relate to that. Um, so self-compassion then is not sidestepping responsibility at all. Quite the opposite. Yeah. Quite the opposite. Okay. Yeah. Um, in your experience, are there any limitations to self-compassion? Can you can it be seen sometimes as a panacea? Well, um, well, it's interesting. One of the most powerful things about self-compassion is it allows you to help give yourself what you need. So if you need love, if you need a sense of connectedness, if you need validation, um, really the basic needs we all have, self-compassion is a powerful resource for meeting those needs. And yet, of course, uh, we do need other people. So, you know, it can't replace other people. Um, certainly we need the love and support and care of others as well. But if we have the love and support of care of others and not from ourselves, we are still going to suffer. Um, and also other people may not always be available for us. Uh, but, yeah, no, I wouldn't say it's a panacea in the sense that we don't need anything else in our lives or anything from other people, but it's a great help. And it's interesting, research shows that self-compassionate people are better relationship partners. In other words, by meeting a lot of your own needs, you have more resources available to give to your partner. So it helps both yourself and others. Um, it's really not selfish at all. So do you equate or do you, do you see no essential difference between compassion and wisdom? Or are they, they inextricably linked? Well, there's a wisdom element to compassion. And I think um, a lot of the wisdom comes in to the component of com uh, self-compassion having to do with common humanity. Yeah. So when you really look at common humanity and the fact that we're all subject to various causes and conditions that help create who we are, that's a wisdom element. Uh, they aren't exactly the same, however. Um, Self-compassion has a strong emotional element, a sense of warmth, of care. Uh, wisdom may or may not, depending on the subject that's being thought, thought about or, or considered at the time, right? So compassion, um, in, by its very nature, focuses on how do I relate to myself or another? How do I relate to sentient beings with, with an open heart or not? Wisdom really has to do a little more with how do I understand the nature of both, let's say, my experiences and also other sentient beings. But I would say wisdom is broader. And by definition, it doesn't necessarily entail a certain emotional response. Although, of course, the two, you know, go hand in hand and intertwine. Yeah. Can you have one without the other? That's a good question. Um, I don't think you can have self-compassion without wisdom, because, again, that common humanity element. Could you have wisdom without self-compassion? Maybe you could have states of wisdom without self-compassion if it's not relevant at the time. I think if you have deep insight into the nature of shared humanity, into the nature of interconnectedness, um, it's hard to imagine you couldn't have self that you wouldn't have self compassion. Um, what you can have, have though is a lot of people have tremendous compassion for others and not for themselves. It's actually mm. a truism that I would say isn't true that you have to have self compassion before you have compassion for others. There are many people who treat themselves very differently than they treat others. They're kind, caring, loving to others, hard on themselves. The wisdom element, though, I think, if the wisdom is present, you don't have that separation. So, yep. um, yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that, yeah. So I guess my answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, in terms of how to go about cultivating self-compassion, you've recently set up the Centre for Mindful Self-Compassion with a colleague of yours, Christopher Germer. 
Can you tell us something about that project, its aims and objectives, etc.? Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, we've created an eight-week training program to teach people how to be more self-compassionate. Um, it's structured in a similar way to mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, and that was intentional. We kind of see it as a sister program to MBSR, um, something that, you know, hoping that a lot of people would want to take both, but it's explicitly designed to increase self-compassion skills. Uh, it uses meditation. Uh, it also uses informal practices, like, like a very powerful one is simply putting your hands on your heart when you're stressed or feeling bad about yourself, um, you know, evoking particular physiological cues of compassion. So uh, this program is now spreading. We are actually the summer we'll be in Bangor, Wales. We're doing our uh, one of our first training of teachers to teach the program. And we're hoping that it'll spread throughout the world. <laughs> but it's, it's, a very, it's very exciting because it seems to be, um, well, people have report having a very good experience with the program. Oh, well, I wish you the best of luck with that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, okay, uh, Kristin, what is your understanding of the middle way? Well, um, for me, the middle way is, <laughs> it seems so trite to say to find balance, but, uh, you know, really, I think that's that over and over again, that's what the middle way is pointing to, um, not, you know, finding about balance between autonomy and connectedness, for instance, between, um, boy, you stumped me with this one, <laughs> gotta, gotta look at my Buddhist books, um, Really just, uh, so for instance, finding a balance between caring for yourself and caring for others, um, not taking our thoughts too seriously, and yet taking them seriously enough to be functional, um, the same with our emotions, uh, really not taking an extreme position on everything um, with the understanding eventually that points to non-duality, right, that... And I'm not going to give you my five-second version of non-duality, but <laughs> to the degree I, I understand it, it's really um, the realization that things are not as separate and uh, individualized and concrete as we think we are. So for me, the middle way, um, you know, some people, they just meditate all the time and they get into the idea of non-duality and they check out of life. Uh, for me, the middle way is holding the understanding of illusion, of maya, that things are not what they seem to be, while still fully inhabiting life and living it um, living it to one's fullest, yeah. Okay, well, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> I pulled that one hopefully out of the hat, I don't know. <laughs> you certainly did, yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, Christine. Ah, thank you. That was fun. All right. <laughs> You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.